Welcome back. It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 66. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and here we take a look at the recent headlines in the world of creationism. What do we have on tap today? Well, we've got Answers in Genesis taking a stand on climate change. We've got Answers in Genesis again that has, has a upcoming Truth About Dinosaur conference. And Answers in Genesis, once again, talks about are we all degenerates? We've got that. Several other items coming up next. Okay, where to begin? I haven't done a This Week in Creationism episode in, mm, oh boy, probably been a month. I've taken a number of news items that I've seen. I've made individual videos about them, kind of like, you know, this is hot stuff. I need to talk about it at the moment, but I haven't sort of collectively looked at the world of young earth creationism and brought together sort of, yeah, hey, here's some other things going on that didn't deserve their own individual videos. So here we are. Uh, yeah, I just made it sound like this isn't going to be that interesting, but actually I think I have some really interesting insights into the world of creationism in this week's episode. So first, let's start off with something I noticed just a couple weeks ago. Their Answers in Genesis is advertising. In this case, you can see I got a, I got a sponsored um, message on Facebook from Answers in Genesis telling me to help my whole family navigate the complexities of a very controversial topic. What is that controversial topic? Well, that's climate change. And they have a new book out now, Climate Change for Kids, well, and for adults too. And written by... None other than Ken Ham, along with two of his employees, Jessica Ford and Avery Foley. The first thing you need to know before you run out and plunk down your $17.95 is that Ken Ham, Jessica DeFord, and Avery Foley have no experience working with climate change science. Right? They've read a few things. Unfortunately, it seems like all they've read is other young earth creationists talking about this topic rather than done a deep dive into the literature themselves. It's very apparent from the couple of articles that have been written on Answers in Genesis by these same authors in preparation, basically, to have this book come out. And so you're not hearing from experts. You're hearing from a highly filtered set of sources. Uh, and this is really climate change for dummies written by, you can fill in the blank. That's what's going on here. Now, I have a reference here to uh, climate alarmism. So this is an article written at Answers in Genesis. I'll put a, a link uh, below this video. Um, if you want to see like their written description of what their opinion is about uh, climate alarmism. All right, so let's just take a, a really quick look at just a couple things about this book, just to give you a flavor and a sense for it. Let's step back here for just a second and remember that Answers in Genesis has kind of taken a Mm, a little bit of a, we don't talk about climate change very much uh, on our on our site. We know it's a controversial issue and um, we don't want to offend certain elements or segments of our own audience. Um, but now I think they realized, eh, we don't have to worry about that because most of our audience is probably of one mind anyway. And with Martin Isles being at the, at the head position of Answers in Genesis now, he certainly isn't afraid to take strong opinions on like all kinds of issues. Ken Ham, you would think it would be in his nature to do so. Uh, and he has, you know, dabbled a little closer to taking a particular position. Um, and you can certainly read between the lines what the position of Answers in Genesis is. I've always been able to do that. But now they're just being very out front and um, forward with uh, their particular approach. And I think it can be summed up on with, with this. The, the written text here is from the... Um, the page, the, the the seller's page for this particular book, the blurb, all right? Some people are claiming the earth will be destroyed in a few years. Uh, if the supposed, all right, all right, supposed man-made climate change isn't stopped, it's clearly taken a position that we're not responsible. Even if there is some change that's occurring, well, change is natural, change always happens, and so therefore, the big whoopee. And why is it a big whoopee? Well, look at your seven different ages of climate. Right, according to the biblical worldview, pages provided. All right, uh, while they're selling the book, uh, the biblical climate ages. All right, you start out with what perfection, the perfect climate, just like you had perfect genomes and perfect animals and perfect. You have a perfect climate, right? And then you have a groaning climate. You know, after Adam's sin, bringing in. Uh, catastrophe in the world. So now you have 
natural disasters, I guess, you know, like earthquakes, and uh, you have uh, organisms that are dying, all right? So the, the, the climate is groaning and it's changing. And of course, that rapidly changes with the flooding phase, right? Noah's flood, oh, obviously that's a giant climatic event since the entire globe was covered with water uh, and then massive amounts of rain, right? You know, so that's a, that's a global catastrophe. That's truly destroying the world, right? You see the setup here is like, the world has been destroyed before and it can never be destroyed again. So therefore, you don't have to worry about climate change. It can't destroy the world in the sense of absolutely obliterating the entire world. Uh, then you had the icy climate age, right? Because you have this single biblical ice age that occurs about three or 400 years after global flood, right? So after Noah departs and the animals migrate and then the earth gets cold and there's this very fast several hundred year period in which the earth is under an ice age. So that is a dramatic change over just a few hundred years. And now we have, we're in the current age, which is the shifting climate change, all right? That is, the Earth has been warming since the, since the um, Ice Age. So this is, in a way, uh, this is how you can say that, well, yeah, all right, it, it is getting warmer, all right? Uh, we can acknowledge that uh, the world is getting somewhat warmer. But, you know, this is just a byproduct of the shifting times that we live in, and these are just natural processes. We shouldn't have to worry about this. We don't have anything to do with it. Um, we can't actually affect the world. Well, I mean, except for sin caused the global flood. So I guess, you know, we could cause the utter destruction of the earth in the past, but we can't cause the utter destruction of the earth in the future, uh, apparently. And then what are we heading toward? Well, apparently the world is warming up, right? Because it's going to end up in fire. Now, this, this is the end times fire of everything being burnt up and, you know, passages in Second Peter about this. This is a particular eschatological uh, viewpoint or particular interpretation of scriptures, which certainly not all Christians um, take a literal sense uh, understanding of that particular passage. Uh, but nonetheless, so here's the answer in Genesis is like, you know, yes, the world will be destroyed but it will be God who will destroy and burn up the entire world. But of course, we're going to be raptured or lifted out of this world prior to that time. So don't worry about climate change. Things happen. The world's shifting. We're just biding our time here. And, you know, most young earth creationists have kind of an eschatology of the world is running down, right? It's decaying and there's moral decline. and uh, Things are, are going to pot, but eventually we're going to be rescued out of this. And there's very little you can do to change either either one, either the climate or the natural decay of the world uh, as it exists. And then after being raptured out or brought out of this earth, uh, off this earth, then there's the heavenly phase, which is yet another, it's like the bookends of perfection and another form of perfection in heaven. So this this is the guiding theme of the entire book. Right, the seven circles or the seven ages, the seven climate ages um, that, that uh, the world and all uh, human history will uh, experience. Going back up to this text here, so some people believe the world will be destroyed. Uh, and now the straw man is is that they pick out like the, the wild claims of uh, or the most extreme versions of climate change activists and say like, well, they said that the world will be you know just the humans will be wiped off the earth in the next five years. We don't think that's really true. Well, okay. And so when it doesn't become true, they'll be like, see, we were right, right? Climate change didn't actually destroy the world. Um, and I don't want to go down like a whole bunch of trails. And I don't look at the evidence. We're not going to talk about climate change here myself, other than just to say that this is this is just setting up a, a um, this isn't really confronting the real issues of climate change. I'll just put it that way. Now, Ken Ham and Jessica Ford, they forecast another 10 years that we'll find these predictions haven't come true. Why haven't they come true? Well, as I just said before, God's word makes it clear that we can't destroy the earth. There's nothing we can do to destroy the earth. Now, they kind of will admit that we can kind of like trash it a little bit, right? We, we should be careful with our resources and not allow it to become complete because we should be caring for the creation. You know, there's a certain form of stewardship of, of governing God's creation. But no matter how bad we are, 
we can't destroy ourselves because God is, will preserve us. Um, all right, so that's number one, right? It just can't happen. So therefore, don't, you know, don't worry about it. Don't really worry about it that much. Don't be concerned when people tell you that, that, that this is something we have to do, take extreme measures for. Uh, and then secondly, and here's the thing. Um, it's not just God's word, but they think the evidence supports this particular view from a scientist. It's just like creation science, right? You know, it's like, um, you know, we believe this is true, but oh, here's all this evidence that proves that the world is young. Not just presuppositionally, we believe the world is young. We think that even if you looked at the evidence, you would come to the conclusion that the world is young. Same thing with this climate change. Real observational science. There's a whole section in the book on observational science versus historical science, right? That's what they love to talk about, make that distinction. Not radical interpretations of some of the data. Radical interpretations of some of the data. Real, you, know, you were doing real observational science, you'd find out that it wouldn't support this idea that we're responsible or have anything to do with uh, in climate change. In fact, there's even some doubt that there's even climate change happening in terms of like the world really getting warmer. Uh, either it's just a very temporary blip or even the data that says suggests it's getting warmer is being fudged in some way. All right, so doubt, doubts are cast all over the place in terms of climate science uh, in this book. All right, so this is a uh, you know this is something that, that I think they're going to be talking about a lot more. Obviously, they're going to they're starting to be much more bold and aggressive with this particular view. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Beyond Bones. I've been also seeing uh, advertisements from Answers in Genesis for this new conference coming up. See, we invite you to learn how starting with a biblical worldview beginning in Genesis equips us to explain and understand dinosaurs. She just love to talk about dinosaurs. Ken Ham is like, you know, dinosaurs are the best apologetic tool. Talk about dinosaurs and you'll lead people to, to Christ. You'll also learn how scientific evidence confirms God's word about these amazing creatures. So what are you going to learn at this conference? When did dinosaurs live? Well, you know what they're going to say about that. Did dinosaurs and humans live together? Well, yes, of course they did. Did dinosaurs have feathers and evolve into birds? Yeah, they can't help themselves but talk about feathers and try to draw this distinction between dinosaurs and non-dinosaurs, birds. Only birds have feathers. Dinosaurs can't have feathers. They're going to have an expert to talk about this. Did dinosaurs soft has dinosaur soft tissue been found? All right, so that's your that's your main topics, and I'll I'll show you. Here's your speakers. Now here's your experts. Here's who's going to be leading this conference. Uh, that you can uh, pay 75 bucks to attend at the, I think it's at the Ark Encounter. And you can hear Ken Ham, yeah, expert on, on, on dinosaurs, right? Georgia Purdom, Dr. Georgia Purdom, molecular geneticist, who hasn't done genetics work in some 25, well, actually hasn't done any since she got her PhD, and does very little, uh, does had really done no science stuff since she uh, got to... Uh, answers in Genesis. And then you've got Dr. Gabriella Haynes, who is a paleontologist PhD, but if you follow this channel and others that have inspected her work, you'll know that she's way outside of her element, talking about dinosaurs. <laughs> and But she's the one that has been tasked by answers in Genesis to sort of spearhead the whole feathered dinosaurs are a um, uh, an evolutionary lie. Right? And so can't can't have feathers on, on anything that, that we would ever call a dinosaur. And so she'll be giving that particular talk. Um, and then you have Joel, and I don't know how to say his name, Lena Weber. Um, and he's the vice president of design and web development. Okay. So you have one person at this conference on, you know, dinosaurs who at least has been in some area of science related potentially to that. I mean, to paleontology uh, and three others who haven't at all. And that's your expert lineup. I mean, answers and justice really suffers from a lack of expertise, true expertise in areas in which they, they are most likely to want to talk about. Right. They have experts that are experts in things that are very disinteresting to most people. And so those, Experts then have to talk about other topics. 
Uh, so here's your schedule, right? Dinosaurs in the Bible, Ken Ham, I've heard that talk a hundred times. I mean, all these talks can be found online. You don't have to pay $75, all right, to go hear these talks and find out what they're going to say, because this has all been said before. I can't imagine there'll be one new word spoken. It'll be the same slides, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe they'll have a new design for them. It's going to be all the same words, right? Georgia Purdom is going to talk about dinosaur soft tissue. Um, now, I've never heard her talk about that, but it doesn't matter. She's not going to do any original research or back work to, to, to come up with this talk. These are going to be pre-prepared slides that have been used. There's like, there's like a whole set of slides that Answers in Genesis development team comes up with uh, and have been approved by somebody who has at least maybe some science experience. And then you just kind of go in and you pull out the slides you need in order to develop the talk that you're going to give. Um, what's behind the idea of feathered dinosaurs? So that's Gabrielle Haynes. And then easy to see the differences between dinosaurs and birds. Their web design develop, you know, development term person is going to give this, you know, I, yeah, I can tell you how to tell the difference between dinosaurs and birds. Uh, yeah, don't put me down for laying down 75 bucks and going to the Ark Encounter uh, for this particular conference. All right. Now, um, on a lighter, little lighter fare here. I, uh, creation.com has uh, caught the AI bug. And I'm, I'm totally fine with using AI images. I mean, after all, I'm using them for thumbnails. I generate them for some purposes. I try to identify when I'm using AI imagery, which I they, they have a function uh, and they have a place. They don't have a face on Facebook nature photography pages. All right, if, if, if you are a follower of mine on Facebook, you know that that's a big bugaboo of mine and I constantly call that out. Just absolutely sick to death of AI images which are being passed off as photographs. Um, just terrible, all right? I just can't stand it. Um, so my I, I am height, I have a heightened sense for the AI imagery thing. And so I've been seeing from creation.com a number of different uh, little, you know, graphics, infographic type things, right? So here we have uh, shared on Facebook or you know, X or other places, right? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and spread out the earth by myself. All right, so just a, you know, here's a Bible verse, inspiration of the day, and here's the image they chose to go with it. I am Lord who made all things. I alone stretched out the heavens. So it gets kind of like, uh, this is space. And spread out the earth by myself. Why a, a child in space, in a spacesuit? I, I, it's like, who, who, who thought that that was like, a good representation of what is being said in this verse in scriptures. I mean, why do we need to use a fake? In this case, why do we use a need to use a fake image for something that could be easily achieved with a, you know, Hubble telescope or James Webb uh, space telescope image, right? Which is the actual real heavens, all right? It's literally heavens spread out, you know? <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, I, I just, I don't know who made these decisions to choose these things, but this other one's a little more, <laughs> like, I lo love the second one. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living things and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Okay. So here's an image of the creation, you know, uh, uh, in Genesis one, remember the perfect world, the perfect state of the world. When God created swarms of living creatures and fl birds flying over the earth, right? Over the surface of the earth. And then, I don't know if you can see it very well here, but there is a plastic bottle in this picture. It's an AI created image, right? AI decided like, hey, you want an image of, of a bird flying over the ocean with a, with a fish in it? Well, naturally, you know, you need a, an old plastic bottle there because that really represents what the ocean looks like. <laughs> it's like it's, but like, why use this? Who thought looking at this image like, yeah, that's a really great image that represents the swarms of living creatures living in the ocean and the birds flying over the sea in the original creation that there's a plastic bottle there. 
It's like, again, I'm, I'm okay using AI imagery, but like use an image that makes sense. Not like this is the first one that came out and I'm in a hurry. So let's just slap it on here and go. Answers in Genesis cannot let go of the feather thing. Right. They're, they're just it's a it's the hill they're going to die on. It, it just is. They're never going to give up. Even if all other young earth creationists come out, which most of them have, and said this is a ridiculous position, a ridiculous hill to die on, that there aren't organisms that have mostly dinosaur like features and anatomy that also have feathers. So there was another report, you know, this is just going to keep hitting them over and over and over again, right? Every three or four weeks, there's going to be a new paper that is going to challenge the answers in Genesis viewpoint. And this is yet another group of birds. I'm oh, sorry. I just, this is a group of dinosaurs that even it is the, what's so funny is that this particular, it's not, this isn't the actual, this is just a picture of a bird they're using here. But they're referring to a new article that looks at a, a, a newly described fossil. It's actually a fossil that's been around for a long time, but somebody finally looked at it with new techniques and realized that there's some very amazing uh, feathers and feather attachments on this particular fossil. Well, there are hundreds of other known fossils from this particular group of dinosaurs. And I say dinosaurs because they've always been described as dinosaurs. And What's funny is Answers in Genesis at the Ark Encounter has a list, right, of all the different kinds uh, that were on the Ark, including the kinds of the different kinds of dinosaurs. And they list us as a kind of dinosaur. But now there's one fossil of all those that shows evidence that they have feathers. And so they're all birds, of course. <laughs> it's, like, it's like because they have feathers, even though all other features were described as Dinosaurs. I mean, they never disputed the fact that this was a dinosaur until all of a sudden a feather was found. And then suddenly it switched categories um, because they can't be called a dinosaur and have feathers. And you might think this is just all semantics, but when you listen to Gabriella Hay, she tries to make it sound like this is some like profoundly important thing uh, about, um, you know, that, that we creationists cannot call uh, cannot use utter the words dinosaurs with feathers because that would be utter capitulation to evolutionary theory. It can't happen. I mean, never mind that a whole bunch of other younger creationists are just totally fine with, hey, God created some kinds of dinosaurs with feathers. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> how hard was that to say, right? <laughs> like some dinosaurs are created with crests and some dinosaurs are created with bills, like, you know, like without teeth, right? Just like some birds have. We, like we can, Andrews and Dennis can say that, but they cannot utter the word, it's got a feather. <laughs> it's like, or any kind of feather, anything that looks like a feather that we think isn't a, you know, that we, we still want to call a dinosaur, we just call it not a feather. Um, yeah, it's, it's getting a little ridiculous. Okay. Some other, you know, answers in Genesis has just really gotten into, um, you know, these little quotes, pithy quotes that they just splash all over social media. Uh, and so I pulled out just a couple that are related to each other because they kind of go in waves like themes, like a whole bunch that are similar to each other, sort of like little campaigns, right? Social media campaigns. Um, so here, the mere fact that people can produce offspring that are not largely deformed is a testimony to creation not evolution. This is a statement that, um, of, you know, everything is wearing down. Everything's, you know, there's genetic entropy that uh, organisms are accumulating mutations. Uh, and thank goodness those mutations aren't any worse. Something's holding them at bay. Otherwise we would all just be extinct now. Because remember, Anthrogenes thinks that all species are going extinct. They have a limited lifespan, right? And since they can't make new kinds, the all the or vegetation is doomed so whenever god comes and destroys the world by fire it could be that there will be nothing left here except for humans i guess so the you know the mere fact that even we're even alive today must point toward creation and not evolution because of this genetic entropy oh here's another example we must remember that our brains have suffered from six thousand years of the curse this is the same idea, right? Mutations are happening. 
our brains are mutating and therefore we used to be much smarter. We used to be able to do many more things. This is, this is the idea that before the flood, man was a lot more intelligent, capable of doing a lot more things. Uh, we've lost a lot of technology because of the restriction through the flood. Um, so we were more perfect at the beginning and had perfect ability to reason and so forth. And we have less ability to reason now. Another reason to believe that it's just another reason or excuse to say like, you know, can't trust anybody because you're, you have a degenerated brain and you obviously can't think right. Uh, and, but fortunately we have, uh, I'm, I'm no, I'm sounding sarcastic because you know that I'm, I'm a Christian and this is why I'm, but I'm upset because I'm kind of offended by this stuff. Um, this is kind of like saying, well, but we have the Bible, right? And so that keeps us on the narrow and true and nobody else can trust their brains. So, but we have the truth. Um, and I happen to believe that we have the truth too, but in my interpretation of that truth, it's different. Um, okay, another one. When we use Genesis as the basis for understanding history, we can make sense of evidence, which otherwise would be a real mystery. So it kind of goes along that same theme, right? Um, we can't, you can't really truly understand the evidence, right? And put it in the right context because you don't have Genesis as the basis of your understanding. Uh, and lastly, this is the one that kicked it off for me. Uh, this is one of the first ones I saw, and I've already made a video about this one, right? Ken Ham, we are all degenerates, right? Where I, I spent a long time, you know, talking about this degeneration idea and the implications of that. Uh, and so this is and, and so this is what got me started thinking. We have greatly degenerated compared to people many generations ago. And you might think he's talking about moral decay, because Answers just constantly talks about moral decay. And I think implicit in this is a bit of that. And I know that many people who saw this when they commented, that's what they were thinking. Oh yeah, you're right. I mean, 50 years ago, people were so much better than they are now, right? society is falling apart and so we're degenerating and that that's also part of this degeneration over time from the original perfect relationships at the beginning but what Kenham has in mind here because of the article that is connected to because most people wouldn't click to that that article is about where Cain got his wife and it's all an article about DNA degeneration it's all about the fact that people had perfect genomes in the past therefore Ken, uh, Kenham Therefore, you know, Cain could marry his sister and that wouldn't be a problem because genetically it wouldn't be a problem because it wouldn't create problems to, clo to, to marry a sister, right? So it's a, it's a genetic explanation for how, why uh, there wasn't uh, rules against uh, marrying a close sibling in the past. And so he is referencing molecular DNA degeneration in this particular uh, quote here. Uh, but you can learn a whole lot more about that if you uh, watch my other video. Uh, one really quick thing here, because I just I just need to note this, because it's going along with a theme that I'm working on, and that is Answers in Genesis making a pivot, you know, slightly changing and becoming more political than they have been in the past. And of course, they've hired Mark Niles to be the, their new head honcho. And he still is kind of like, he's doing stuff for Answers to Genesis, but he has his own personal Facebook page and he has his own other stuff going on, uh, which isn't like always branded as Answers in Genesis. Um, so I think he'll become more integrated over time. But he, he takes a lot of stances sort of outside of the Answers in Genesis, sort of like I'm a, my official role. Um, but this clearly will become the position of Answers in Genesis because charismatic leaders are never separated from like the organization that they, they lead. Uh, so whatever he says in whatever venue he says really will represent or eventually will become the position of Answers in Genesis. Uh, I just want to note here that uh, he's far more willing to make political statements and to back political uh, candidates. And he wrote a big post uh, a couple weeks ago in which he basically defends uh, Trump and uh, the, and talks about what's wrong with the convictions that, of, that Trump has recently, the recent convictions of Trump. 
Uh, and, and, you know, he's like, yeah, I mean, there were some details and things that are not so great about him and all that. But he basically papers over a lot of stuff and tries to provide a rationale for how he could still support um, Trump. And so that is one of the most, uh, for me, the most direct political statements I've seen from a member of Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham is, a, you know, is somewhat careful about not being overtly uh, political. You can always read the lines and know exactly how he feels, but he doesn't say it like straight out. Um, okay, last item is uh, just a reminder to myself uh, that, that I need to make a video and I can make this video now about the mud problem. Uh, this is a paper that came out in a creationist journal that critiques the creationists understanding of, well, creates flood geology, critiques flood geology uh, from the perspective of, hey, if you uh, mix everything up, you're going to have a whole lot of mud. You're going to have thousands of feet in some places of mud. And there's certain rules of physics that don't allow that mud to consolidate quick enough for you to be able to, be able to stand on it or, or for it to be able to, to end up in a in an organized structure as we see the the rock record today uh, and i've been waiting for another video to uh, really explore and review that article before i did mine because i have a, a similar perspective but i want to touch on some other issues uh, and so, but I highly recommend uh, Gutsy Gibbons uh, video, the, the mud problem, in which she goes through that entire paper and she really gets into some of the mechanics of the, the, the physics of mud consolidation uh, in a way that I, I really couldn't do that clearly. And so I'm really going to build on her particular video. And so I'll put a link to her video uh, below. All right. Hey. Thanks for listening. And yeah, I've been playing around with AI. I just criticized uh, AI image use, um, but just for fun, I, uh, I've played with one of the music generators, Suno, and I've created this uh, end credit song for you. So without further ado, here you go. Thank you very much for listening. The Joel Duff on the screen, education sensation, biology dissected deep like meditation, fossils and genomes, how we're used on a mission, cracking the mysteries, evolutionary translation, fans in the comments, classroom of digital age, from simple cells to the complex, unlock every page, virtual lecture hall, click the bell and engage, Dr. Duff with the knowledge, life's intricate stage, thank you for watching, you the MVP. community subscribe for the journey a click sets us free together we explore this biology microscope visions every pixel in tune joel duff breaking it down lighting up like the moon dna double helix no view obscure from classroom to youtube evolution secured dinosaur bones paleontology roam knowledge homegrown duff carved it in stone from school desks to mobiles the facts getting shown dr duff keep it real academic throne thank you for watching you the mdp community subscribe for the journey a click sets us free together we explore this biology Together we explore its biology.